it, it also feels like image has become such an important thing, like literally to, to the extent of what they may wear <laughs> and then how they're, and yeah. how, and how they're perceived. So, you know, you look at Unai Emery and his record of that, and you may not want to talk about this, Tim, particularly from a, with a, with a Wolves hat on, but um, you look at Unai Emery and what he has done at Villa and indeed what he has done at other clubs as well, Sevilla and, and Villarreal. And yet, certainly in this country, because of his image, I would argue, he doesn't get anywhere near the attention and the respect that he probably should do. Yeah, you're right. And that comes from, you know, his spell at Arsenal. And, you know, he, he was a figure of fun on Twitter. And, you know, club, clubs do look at this stuff. I think it's insane. But you do get you do get chairman on, on Twitter judging, judging the reaction of, of replies to club tweets. Which is bonkers because I, I mean, I, I, I completely ignore it. I think it's a lot of it's irrelevant, and yet you've got people running football clubs who put a lot of sway into that sort of public mood. And yeah, you're you're absolutely right about um, appearance and being the face of it and the media game. Um, I remember Arsenal turning their nose up at Nuno because you know his his media relations were absolutely abysmal, um, and they were like, he can't be the face of this of this this global brand. Because that's what it is as well. It's not just yeah. eleven players on a, on a pitch, um, and you know they they have they have got to answer to everything. I remember Conte moaning a lot recently about how he has to answer for for absolutely everything at the club, be that decisions that Levy makes or decisions that Fabio Paratici makes. And he was like, you know, in Italy, uh, the director of football, directors of football, uh, hold press conferences and 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 have to speak at certain clubs before and after games. But here, that's very that's very different. You know, they can they can hide, and um, I would I, definitely bring that in here. I would definitely 100%. bring that in here to help, particularly to help these guys who are sometimes doing. I, I would I would reckon fifteen interviews a week. Some of them, the top ones, when you take in press conferences, post match, TV, radio, newspapers. I mean, it's bloody stupid. I'm not sure the general public has any idea of the media demands that that are put on on head coaches foreign broadcasters foreign broadcasters before and after every game be that an EFL cup tie against against Grimsby or a Champions League tie um yeah written press radios tv club media and it's all on one man it's insane you know and it's not a, it's not a small part of the job and it, and it's something you've got to be good at i think um and uh, and yeah, that's definitely that one. That is that's never going to change. I don't think anytime soon. But it's certainly something that should. I agree, Mark. Ollie? Yeah, I think I think the, the the cult of the manager in English football is is enormous. You could say it dates back to you know Mourinho and Ferguson and Wenger and that sort of very visual Premier League you know Premier League years. But yeah, you know, even even you go back to the the sixties and seventies and there's. Very a great focus on Shankly and Busby and Clough and Malcolm Allison and all, all all these all these great managers Bill Nicholson Bertie Mee and it's it's yeah th- there's always been there's always been an intense focus on the man. Well, they only had to talk to like they only they didn't do press conferences, did they? They did they, they sort no, of you know did no, no, a post match interview on a on the they did, probably didn't do pre match interviews actually. They'd do a quick post match interview. On the pitch, weren't they? Yeah. And then, a, and then a little huddle with with some journalists. Sometimes yeah. on the bus on the way back with a pint. Oh yeah, in the pub. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, the glory oh, days. The glory days. <laughs> but but the serious point is, for for all it was, Malcolm Allison or Clough or whatever, it was they were that the demands the demands on them were were by no means the same. Mm. No, the, the the funny thing is when Eddie Howe went to. Newcastle, and even when he was going to go to Celtic uh, in the summer of 2020, 20, 2021 it was, um, there was a lot of talk of whether the sort of size of the club and the sort of goldfish bowl aspect of both of those clubs would be would be what made it you know, a struggle for him, and whether whether sort of personality wise he was he was able to be that sort of beacon talisman um type figure that that those um those particular clubs with those particular fan bases w- would would desperately need him to be i remember jamie carragher once saying to me 
about Roy Hodgson. You know, if you, his tactics weren't that that different to Rafa Benitez at Liverpool, but personality-wise, he was just completely wrong for Liverpool. He, he never he never seemed to realise that everything he said would be scrutinised by a by a fan base that that, that were sceptical about him. And I think that yeah, we, we go back to Eddie Howe. I think the I think that's probably been a concern that Everton had about him at one stage when they were thinking about him. Arsenal had about him at one stage when they were thinking about him, thinking, you know, is he is he big enough personality-wise? Tottenham as well. Is he big enough personality-wise to be able to be the the sort of voice of this club, face of this club? And I think it's shown at Newcastle, he definitely is. And he's had to ask, you know, he's been faced with some very, very, very uncomfortable questions, rightly, about, about that regime. And nobody else at the club has been able to sort of take this take the heat off him in that regard. But he he's you know look I don't think he's answered those questions adequately. But I think maybe the best thing for Newcastle is is if he sort of ducks them slightly, as unsatisfying as it might be for us in the media. Um, and I think he's shown he has got the personality to to, to handle that. Whether he's got enough to take Newcastle the extra mile and and then you know be the manager that leads them to trophies or to advanced stages in the knockout stages or uh, not uh, the Champions League or challenging for the league or whatever. I don't know, but I think he's shown he is a manager capable of managing a, a big and very ambitious club as well as a small one. Which is really interesting on a final point. And, and it kind of brings us back to, to Tottenham. and it But it also brings us to the cyclical things and fashion and being in the moment and so on and so forth. Eddie Howe at Newcastle, Tim, appears to be forgotten because of Graham Potter at Chelsea in any discussion about who a new manager at Tottenham might be, right? Mm. So Graham Potter struggles at Chelsea, even though it's a completely different situation to the one that Tottenham are in, is seen as or oh, would they really look at Deserby or Thomas Frank or Marco Silva, right? Because promoting from within the Premier League, i.e. going up the su- supposed chain, well, it's not really working for Chelsea and Graham Potter at the moment, so is that a risk? Ignore him. Ignore him the fact that, you know, Eddie Howe was sacked at Bournemouth and seems to be doing a very good job at, at Newcastle. It's amazing how the debate is framed in the moment. Yeah, it always comes back to Tottenham, doesn't it, Mark? It does. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'd love to know if 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 chairman and owners have these discussions as well, um, because you, you're right. That's how it's framed, and that's the narrative, you know, sort of media wise and amongst supporters. Um, but yeah, I, I, I genuinely do not know why Tottenham would not go um, for a manager. Well, like like many you've just mentioned there, um, I was talking to someone. Uh, before Spurs Wolves recently, and they said Lopetegui would be a great fit for Spurs. Um, you know, he's 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 managed at the top level. He's won he's won trophies. Uh, he's tactically very astute. Uh, he's very personable. He's been very successful. You know, why on earth would Tottenham not not hire him? But I guess because he's maybe because he's uh, of his failures, his failures at Real Madrid, or you know, he's a little bit older. Um, whereas actually, he'd he'd be a very very good fit. Um, I mean, really, we should get Daniel Levy on to. To, to ask why <laughs> but but there comes back to a wider point about never hearing about you know the the accountability or the reasoning behind these these decisions because um yeah they're the ones that make them 